So I'd like to, I'm happy to introduce a uh, friend and colleague, Mark Boslow. Uh, Mark got, uh, did his undergraduate at uh, Colorado State, right? Yes, Colorado State. And then did his uh, PhD at Caltech and then spent uh, 33 years at Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, then he went to uh, Los Alamos, where he's currently uh, working at the University of New Mexico and Los Alamos. His specialty is airburst, but he's also, I think, uh, quite well known for being a, a prolific writer and contributor to the uh, Skeptical Inquirer. I noticed when I said at the uh, added value, I said Enquirer, which is how we say it in Canada, and <laughs> instead, of, instead of Inquirer. So <laughs> I just want to make that clear, clear. So yeah, pleasure to have you here, Mark. Thanks, Rob. And I can hear myself on the speaker, so I assume you can all hear me. Um, <laughs> so I, I kind of created a little bit of a clickbaity type title. So I was hoping that uh, a lot of people here, and I'm glad to see you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm on vacation, so <laughs> I uh, I'm here for the, for having fun, and I hope this is fun for you too. Um, so I'm going to talk about the physics of uh, cosmic airbursts, and and uh, as Rob pointed out. Um, I'm very interested in airbursts. My interest really started with the uh, uh, impact of Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 on Jupiter, which was a spectacular airburst. And of course, Jupiter doesn't have a solid surface, so it's atmosphere all the way down to the core. So there's nothing to stop it but Jovian air. Um, I'm going to start off. Um, I spent, so I, I uh, left Sandia in 2017, and then I had a year off before I went started at Los Alamos in, in uh, the fall of 2018. And I had the summer of 18 off. And um, one of the reasons I know Rob well is because he co-organized this program on asteroids at uh, Technical University Munich. And so the first few slides here I stole from my uh, presentation there. And, and so I asked a question. Um, if an asteroid falls and nobody is there to see it, does it still look cool? <laughs> and the answer, this should never happen. <laughs> we, <laughs> we should see them coming. Um, and so this is what should happen. Um, we should use them as an opportunity to do two things, um, adventure tourism and science. And so this is my kind of my, uh, uh, you know, my fantasy of what I would like to see. And, and there's a precedent for this. And, and I didn't actually realize that this was going on right now. I'd heard that people did this, but I met a guy um, named Mark Risby um, at a meeting um, a while back. And I actually had just seen him and he didn't even mention this to me. Um, but he runs tours on charter flights to see the Southern Lights. Um, and he just posted this on Facebook. So I grabbed these off of Facebook. This is the charter. This is a Dreamliner. This is the cockpit. Um, and, and, and so they actually have scientists on board um, in this, this uh, trip they did just over the weekend. They had scientists on board, but they also take adventure tourists. And so here is their flight out of Adelaide. And, and they wait until there's a prediction of a uh, of good aurora, and then they take off. So in a way, it is kind of like what I am proposing for these supposed death, so-called death plunge objects that you can actually discover in advance and then take a flight or some, somehow get to where they're going to happen. But you need a little bit of, of warning. And this is uh, a view on the right from the flight deck and on the left, I think just, I think it actually, I see a wing uh, above, so it must be a camera mounted underneath the plane. Um, so the first, what I call, so I refer to these as death plunge objects. And so as we know in, in planetary defense, we have, for the big objects, we need years of warning, which means many orbits in advance. So what I refer to as death plunge objects are imminent impactors, objects that are found on final approach. They're not going to go around again. They're, they're, they're going to hit the Earth next time they have an, an encounter, very much like 
always happens in the movies, right? They never find them until they're headed straight towards Earth. So I got this in my email um, on October 6, 2008. Um, I, I wasn't on the mailing list, but someone forwarded this to me. Um, and it was after um, it, this 2008 TC3 object um, had been discovered and the orbit had been calculated and it was definitely going to hit. And, and I, you know, there was still enough time. I thought, ah, you know, we got to get somebody there. It's going to hit in Northern Sudan. Who do I know in Northern Sudan? Turned out nobody. Um, but I did know people in Egypt and it's like, well, you know, it should be visible from Egypt. So I emailed uh, people I knew in Egypt and didn't get a response. So I thought, okay, there's still time. So I called up, I, I had just corresponded with uh, Seth Borenstein, who's a science uh, journalist for the Associated Press. And I let him know. And, and I asked him, you know, could, do you think you can get a photographer there? And he kind of blew me off. It's like, okay, I got the scoop. And it's like, we can get pictures of this, come on. And, and he, he wrote this and he was the first one to report it. <sighs> so here's what the orbit looks like. And of course, you're not going to discover it now. It's tiny, and it's also in conjunction with the sun from the Earth. The Earth is the blue, the purple is the the object, and you're not even going to get it when they when it's in the night sky because it's still too tiny. It's too far away, and you don't get it till right there, and then boom, it hits. So you have like less than a day in this case, um, and it turns out somebody did have a phone camera. Um, it it actually was observed. This is the, the dust trail. This is basically all the material that ablated and then recondensed. And then it happened in the pre-dawn sky. So the sun isn't up yet um, on the surface in northern Sudan, but the sun is shining on the debris. And so somebody snapped a picture of the, of the debris in the sky just by luck. I don't think they had gotten my email message and they probably hadn't read Seth's article. Um, and it was also observed um, by US government sensors. And, and this data at that time wasn't being um, regularly released, um, but it is now being transferred to JPL. So JPL puts, puts this data on their CNEOs website so you do get this information but this was uh specially released and it didn't come out for a while so it was so it was observed in space before impact the impact was sort of observed i mean it was directly observed here it was also photographed the aftermath was uh observed from the ground and it was also meteorites were recovered on the surface so this was what i would call a trifecta those three things um all happened and this is Peter Yeniston, one of my colleagues. And in fact, I was, uh, I had started corresponding with him immediately afterwards, you know, with the idea of actually going there. And then I, uh, I had done this expedition for a documentary and I'll, I'm going to show you a clip from that to go to the Eastern Europe, or I'm sorry, Eastern, uh, scratch that, Western Egypt <laughs> to the Libyan desert um, to explore the Libyan desert glass. And this is in the Nubian desert in, in uh, northern Sudan and I put the documentary producer in touch with Peter and they ended up filming a documentary about this called Countdown to Impact. So here are is the timeline of pre-impact death plunge discoveries. The first one way over um, in 2008, 2008 TC3. Then there were uh, there was one that wasn't it was discovered, um, uh, and then it wasn't observed the impact except indirectly by infrasound over the Atlantic. Then there was one 2018 LA, which happened to, to be discovered when we were in uh, Bavaria. Um, and then there's 2019 MO, uh, which blew up in the skies near Puerto Rico. And then finally, um, when I was visiting Rob, by coincidence, um, in uh, March of this year, there was one that exploded in uh, north of Iceland. So remarkably, um, the one, the, the 2018 object, 
was reported when we were at this asteroid conference and we were exploring the Reese crater, an impact crater, and we were having lunch um, at a beer garden inside the crater. And I don't remember if it was inside the Reese or the, uh, the Steinheim crater. I think it was in the smaller one, the Steinheim, but you might recognize some of these spaces. And all of a sudden we're sitting there eating lunch and all of a sudden everybody's beeper goes off and it's because this uh, 2018 LA had just, it wasn't called that yet. It had just been discovered and was on a collision course. And here's a video of it. It ended up right on the track um, over Botswana. And so, and I think they, uh, Peter Jeniskins again did go to uh, Africa and he found meteorites associated with this one. Did you play the video? I'm sorry? You said it was a video, right? Uh, yeah, but this is just a still. I think, maybe I, you know, I think this is just a still, yeah. Okay, so one thing you can see that they all have in common, if you look carefully, every single one uh, hits the Earth at the pre-perihelion node crossing, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> it's because if they're coming from the other direction, they're coming from the daytime sky, and they're not discovered. So in order to discover these from the daytime sky, you need a space telescope. Um, we are going to have a space telescope one of these days uh, for discovering near Earth objects that uh, NEO surveyor. Um, I do not know whether it will be efficient if the cadence, if it's designed right and if the discovery cadence is right to discover these in advance. But again, um, I think there is an opportunity for a collaboration between tour guides if you can find them far enough in advance, and scientists, very much like the Southern Lights expeditions. Um, so I, uh, you know, this, this whole idea about finding things in advance, I wrote a story in, that was published in Astronomy Magazine about this, and it was about Chelyabinsk, um, the event in Russia in 2013. And I wrote kind of, I started off with a fictional account. I pretended what would have happened if it had been discovered a few weeks in advance before and, and thinking about how much science we could have gotten from this. Now, you know, we just did the dark experiment um, and that I understand was cost something like $300 million. And, and a, a lot of the information we're going to get from that is information about the structure of, of uh, dimorphos, uh, this, you know, how, how does the asteroid material behave under very high shock and strain rate? A lot of that same kind of information could be gotten much more cheaply by observing an event like this. So, you know, I, I imagine some kind of star party, but not just amateurs with telescopes, but professionals with high-speed cameras, with uh, high-resolution photography, with radar, with, you know, anything you can dream up. Um, and, and, and the amount of information we could get out of that, it's basically doing a very uh, uh, interesting uh, impact experiment. Plus, you know, when it's on its way in, we could be gathering a lot of data on the pre-impact asteroid. It's getting close and we're going to know exactly where it is. So imagine, you know, doing some really high resolution imaging of that thing when it's on its way in. So I think you could get a lot of information that would be very useful when it comes to planetary defense. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of a do loop here. <laughs> um, so one of the things that got me really interested in this field was this event, um, August 10th, 1972. And it turns out by pure luck, um, my family was vacationing at this exact spot on that date. And we were in the car and we drove up and got out of the car and we were right, right on the shore of Jackson Lake, right at this spot. And 
everybody was milling around talking about what they had just seen, the UFO. Everybody thought it was a UFO. And I started asking questions and I didn't know what it was, but I had just read this book by Philip Class called UFOs Explained. And one of the one of his examples, he, this is my entry into skepticism. Um, one of his examples was a meteor that had been mistaken for a UFO. And I thought that was probably a meteor. Um, this was in the days way before the internet, right? It's like, there's no way I could find out what it really was. And it was a couple of years later when I was in college in the dorm room watching uh, one of the, some talk show on TV. Um, and they showed a video of this. And this guy explained it. The, they had a, a guest on TV explaining it. And it was a meteor that went through the atmosphere and went back out. And that if it had hit the ground, it would have been like a nuclear explosion. And it's like, wow, <laughs> can I can I get into this field of having no idea that I would end up doing this uh, years later? Well, so one of the things I did I, 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 in, in recent years, I've gotten really annoyed with all the clickbait associated with planetary defense um, and asteroids in general. It's just a clickbait right field. And so I created a blog. I, I had I'd been meaning to create a blog for years, and I finally got around to it this summer. And one of the first things I blogged about, I intentionally created a clickbait title. And I it was August 4th. Um, it was approaching the 50th anniversary of this. And I had recalled that Zdenek Seflika, um, the Czech meteoriticist, <laughs> in 94 had published a paper suggesting he had done all, all this ablation calculations and estimated the speed at which it exited. And the trajectory was in something really close to a 25 year residence. And in his paper, he suggested that it would pass close to the earth again um, around August 10th, 1997. And, and we used to have these, what we call the Super Bowl Eye meetings at Sandia at that time. Dick Spaulding, who was the designer of the bang meter from which the, the, the uh, TC3 was observed, um, he, he organized these and invited Stinnick. And that's where I met Peter Brown and others in the, in the field. And, and so I brought this up and everybody made fun of me. And it's, and, <laughs> and it's like, okay, I'm not going to bring that up again. So just didn't it kind of like, didn't, you know, he, he, this was, they didn't use the word clickbait because it hadn't been invented yet, but they said this was, you know, how did he get this through peer review? And, and in fact, here's, here's my, uh, at the very bottom. So my clickbait was designed to get people to read it. So they'd read all the way to the bottom and it's like, okay, clickbait isn't really good science. And, and so, you know, here's where I kind of got made fun of. And then, and then I said, well, there, you know, there, there is such kind of a, such a thing as academic clickbait. It's a thing, even top, top scientists like Seplica are prone to it. Um, and so our editors, you know, everybody wants to get their stuff in the media that promotes your work. As long as it's scientifically credible, in my opinion, it's okay. And then I went on to say, okay, you know, I, I sucked you in with my clickbait, you know, it's going to come back. Um, but it's vanishingly small. It's possible, but the probability is vanishingly small. Um, and, and so I've been talking about this for a while. This photograph turned up years later from Don Davis when I talked about uh, the 72 event, and he said he was working at a, um, a planetarium in Salt Lake City at the time, and somebody brought in this photograph, and he made a copy of it, and he doesn't know where the original was or who took this photograph, uh, and ever since he sent this to me, I thought, okay, we can do a triangulation, because <laughs> we have the trajectory over the Tetons, we also have a trajectory from a totally different angle. You can see the uh, Seplica's trajectory here, but we could probably refine it and do a better job. The problem is we still don't know its post-encounter orbit that well, because we don't, even though we know the exact line, we don't know how fast it was going, because these aren't videos. Uh, the, the one from uh, uh, the Jackson Lake in front of the Tetons, that's a video, but it doesn't show it exiting. We don't know how fast it's going precisely. But but here's what happened. Here's where my clickbait criticism kind of backfired 
So what happened? So look at this is the top of a ski area, snowboard snowbird in Utah. And here's what happened. Uh, on August 13th, 2022, um, this is another ski area in Utah. <laughs> it's looking a different direction, but it's a different time of day. Um, and so I started getting a lot of calls after this. Um, and I still tried to blame it on spinning. Um, but I but what I really want to do now is refine this trajectory because there is um, also images from different angles and the meteorites were recovered. Uh, so, so we should be able to get a very good trajectory. I predict that it has nothing to do with the one in 1972, but you know, we have enough, we have enough data to show whether or not that's true. So speaking of clickbait, um, I decided to create what I call the clickbait index. Um, because as I said, you know, cl clickbait in science is fine. It's fine to promote good science with clickbait, but it's not fine to promote bad science with clickbait. And how do you distinguish the difference? Well, so there's something called Altmetric. There's a, there's a website called Altmetric and they keep track of scientific papers and how much public media do they get. And we also, uh, can determine like the number of peer reviewed citations they get. And, and so a good way to measure the clickbaitiness of a paper is the ratio of how much press it gets to how much scientific attention it gets. And so I went and the last year they, the Altmetric published a top hundred list was for 2020. And I plotted the top five and then I, uh, there's a paper that I've been very critical of that I talked about um, at the um, journal club meeting this morning, which is uh, the this, this Sodom and Gomorrah um, comet impact paper that was published last year. And I wanted to see how it measured up. And so the top five from 2020 by my index, so it's basically peer reviewed citations on the bottom um, and then all metric score uh, on the vertical axis and that all metric score is basically how much how much media did it get and so i took the ratio <clears throat> so the ones on the upper left are the most clickbaity and and if you look at the five those are the circles the five one's been retracted one's been when been withdrawn um i really like this the uh, there's one called mountable toilet system for analysis of excreta I don't know if it's a coincidence, but that's number two. Um, <laughs> and then there's Bjorn Lomborg, Lomborg, who writes books. He's a climate kind of, he's not a total denier, but he's a severity denier and he's a thorn in the side of climate scientists. And then I haven't looked at number one. It's something about um, sleep deprived masculinity. I need to, I need to look at that at some point. So this was not clickbait. So, um, uh, I happened to be to when when I was uh, working at home. One, late one night, I happened to see somebody post the first one of the first videos about this. It was on the evening of Valentine's Day for me, um, and I was giving a talk the following day. And I had just finished, went online and saw a video, and of course, it was called a UFO. Uh, initially, and it's like, that's not a UFO. And that was big, a big explosion. So unfortunately, I don't have the sound for this, um, but this is one of the most spectacular videos from directly underneath, and you hear lots of booms, not just one, but lots and lots of booms. And one thing nice about this is that they do a lot of panning. And so there's a lot of frames here. There's the boom. You can see this camera. The, 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 the blast wave was so strong. It shook the camera and it's shaking. It's, it's mobilizing dust or coal dust or whatever that stuff is out of building. So it lo almost looks like it's, a, it's an attack. And I, you know, I always wondered you know, how people would have reacted if they would have reacted differently if it had been overcast and they didn't know where the blasts were coming from. And there were actually multiple loud bursts um, and I'll 
talk a little bit about why that was later. So my, my colleague, Peter Brown at University of Western Ontario, he and his students actually took those frames and made a composite. Um, why were there two trails? I got a call from the media uh, the next morning and they asked me, why were there two trails? And I had no idea. And, you know, I hadn't thought it through. It turns out the answer is, is almost obvious. Um, and that is this thing came in at a very shallow trajectory, about 18 degrees from the horizontal. So imagine a tube, the wake as being a tube of, of hot air, very, very hot, hot air, because it's ablated material from the wake. And, and so I modeled that. So down at the bottom there, you can see a little dot. That is the wake filled with hot air. And I ran a simulation, and this is a very simple 2D simulation. And so what happens when you have a, a cylinder, a horizontal cylinder of hot air, it rises buoyantly. Um, but when it first it, it expands, so it's very low density, and then it rises buoyantly, and then it breaks into two and you get vortices. And it's very much like the vortices you get off the tips of an airplane, except in the opposite direction, because an airplane, to create lift, its wings are pushing down on the air. So the air goes down and then the vortices go that way. In this case, that cylinder is pushing itself upward through the air and breaking into these vortices. Um, this is a 3D version of the same thing. And, and you can see the rotation from this orientation. This is just a composite. This is not actually a, a where, it, where it happened, but it's a similar type area. And uh, my colleague, Brad Carvey, who's an expert at scientific visualization, made it look really good. So you can see it's rotating in that outward sense, uh, as it would for a buoyant cloud. So this is uh, Don Davis's uh, uh, art depicting, illustration depicting the Tunguska airburst. And he based this off of my 2008 um, simulation. And, and you can see this expanding shock wave. So there's a, a jet of, of hot debris ablated from the asteroid moving downwards. It's all vapor, doesn't hit the surface. The shock wave hits the surface and the surface is also heated by thermal radiation from that plume, from that downward jet. And so it exceeds the combustion temperature of the trees. And so it created forest fires and then you get a reflection of the blast wave moving upward. So this is this is just my Tunguska simulation, um, and so you see that shock wave reflecting upward, the, and the jet doesn't make it all the way to the surface. Um, I'm coming into focus for some reason. Um, so this is uh, um, a series of simulations I did using the same uh, yield in this case four megatons, which is consistent with a 40 meter diameter asteroid. And I varied the entry angle to see how it, it would affect the shape of the, of the pattern of wind speed on the surface. And, and so the higher the wind speed, uh, the more the trees. Tunguska, right? I'm sorry? Modeling Tunguska. This is, this, is, this is modeling, yeah. This is, this is looking at Tunguska and, and trying to match the wind contours to the observed tree fall pattern that at Tunguska to try to estimate the entry angle and the yield and the size of the thing. And the best match, um, this is this is based on Giuseppe Longo's published work, which was based on his Russian predecessors. Um, he, he, he basically consolidated uh, and aggregated past research into a single map. The one that matched the best um, was about 35 degrees, although uh, Peter Yeniskins published a paper a few years ago with Olga Popova and others, um, where based on actual observations, it's probably less than 30 degrees, probably between 25 and 30 degrees, which is fairly consistent. Um, the key is, though, that it had this epicenter um, where trees weren't blown over, but the branches were stripped off. Um, this is... I. I just made this a few months ago. Um, this is our simulation in 94 of the Shoemaker-Levy-9 impact. And 
you know, I had stills, but I don't think we'd ever turned it into a movie. And we only had five frames. Um, this was the actually the most powerful supercomputer in the world at the time. And we used the entire thing to create this little simulation that I could easily run <laughs> on a few nodes now. But one of the interesting things, so so we focused on the jet that, that came up, the plume, and the, what you see above is the shockwave, because some of you may recall that the impact was actually over the limb. So it wasn't directly observable from Earth because the comet fragments passed, passed over the limb um and you know people were worried we weren't going to see a thing but when we did this simulation this plume or the, the what you see here actually rose to something like 3,000 kilometers and it's over the limb it comes back up over the limb within like a minute or so of, of impact and so we predicted that, that this would be observable what we didn't pay much attention to was what happened at the bottom it keeps pushing down um and that became, became significant later, and I'll tell you why. So here's our, our prediction on the left, and here's what it was observed on the right with the Hubble Space Telescope. So, um, so because it wasn't in exact opposition, the limb and the Terminator were in two different places. There was actually a darn shadow between the limb and the observed uh, uh, Earth-based observer. And so when it first rose over the limb, it was still in shadow. So that's actually thermal radiation there. And then eventually it rose into sunlight and it started condensing. So that was basically a cloud of condensation that we were seeing and it continued to rise for a while. So here is my click baby. Um, when I started trying to convince people that similar type airbursts happen on earth, I created this video. And so this is kind of my concept of what it would look like to see a Tunguska-like event on Earth. And you would, according to our simulations, the same simulations that predicted the plume on Jupiter, you would see a rising plume like that, maybe not in the daytime sky um, because of the light scattering in the atmosphere. So, so now we're gonna go to Libyan desert glass. So I'm kind of progressively, progressively going to bigger impact so this stuff nobody really understood how it formed it's almost pure silica it's found in the western desert of egypt um, there is meteoritic debris mixed in so the dark stuff that you see in there is um it's rich in platinum group elements suggesting meteoritic um, it shows patterns of flow and nobody really had an explanation it doesn't really match what we understand to be tektites, impact form classes. It's not a typical impact <coughs> actite. And so one of, the, um, one of the steps that led me to finally figuring out what I think is the explanation is comparing the difference between an explosion and an impact. So here's, a, here's an explosion. You just set off a five megaton uh, bomb in the atmosphere and it gives you the classic kind of mushroom cloud you get an expansion very much like that wake I showed for uh, Chelyabinsk except instead of a tube it's a sphere so you get an expanding shock wave you get that reflection off the surface and you get this rising and you get the same type of vorticity but instead of linear vortices like Chelyabinsk you get a ring vortex and that's the formation of the mushroom cloud so if you source that exact same amount of energy, but you have the mass of an asteroid and the momentum of an asteroid, you get something entirely different. It goes all the way down to the surface. And that's because when you blow it up, that doesn't make the momentum go away. The jet of really high temperature stuff continues to go downwards until it either couples its momentum to the atmosphere and pushes that bow shock ahead of it, or it hits the surface. And it's actually pinned to the surface by its own inertia. And, and so really, so this, it, it dawned on me, okay, you can have two very distinct types of 
airbursts. The one on the left is what I call a type one, a non-contact airburst or fire in the sky. That's the Tunguska type airburst. And the one on the right explains the Libyan desert glass. It comes all the way to the surface. The temperature of the, of the plume or of the jet is high enough that it actually melts the surface material by ablation and, and it's moving at very high velocity across the surface. And so here's my simulation of that. This is actually a crater forming impact. And you can see that there's sustained high temperature and very high wind along the surface um, for tens of seconds, long enough to melt and ablate it. And then it quenches. So, so in this, uh, so when I went to the Western desert of Egypt for the shooting of this documentary in 2006, um, they really liked this and they created a, their own version of it. Um, this is uh, how I described it. It's like the creme brulee effect. Basically, it's like you take a torch, you point it at sugar, you know, the temperatures are different, everything scales differently, but you end up with a crust on the surface. And that's a piece of the living desert glass in the upper right hand corner. So here is the um, animation of this effect that they created for the documentary. And you can actually go if you want to watch this with narration. Um, I have a YouTube site, I've been systematically uploading these documentaries, documentaries on this subject, and other information about this subject. And my YouTube channel is called Sandia Granite, all one word. So what's next? If this happened once, you would expect <clears throat> it to happen again. And last year, late last year, my colleagues, uh, led by uh, Pete Schultz of Brown University, published a paper where they um, discovered, they reported the discovery of more glass this time in the Atacama Desert, um, that seems to be similar in a lot of ways to the Libyan Desert Glass. Um, and they dated it to about 12,000 years before the present. And so here is, so one of the, one of the mysteries of this glass is it's, there's separate glass sites separated. Um, there's discrete glass sites separated along a line over something like 80 kilometers distance. That became really difficult to explain with a single airburst. So here's a single airburst. Um, this is a 3D simulation. And, and you can see, you know, again, that really high temperature jet moving at very high speed across the surface. And in order to get this separated, uh, all these separated sites, you can explain it with a fragmenting asteroid, uh, but it has to come in at a very shallow angle and break up at 30 kilometers or more above the surface. So here, here's a way you could potentially make it. So this is just my crude first. What happened? Okay, everything's fritzing out a little bit. I don't know what happened. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But that's not sure how to start. Oh, we got to go full screen, maybe? Sometimes it works better if you just go to desktop view and get it. Desktop view? Yeah. Sometimes. This is just from Zoom class experience. So I'll keep talking. I can we do a little verbal preview of what I'm going to show. So, so one of the, um, you know, one of the questions is how can we validate these models? I mean, we don't have that many examples. We have Shoemaker Levy Nine. Um, we have Tunguska, which 
there were not there were some instrumental data there were uh barometer there was barometer data time result barometer data there was some seismic data there were observations there's the tree fall um but you know a lot of a lot of the evidence comes from the geological record but that's true for impact cratering too um you know we pretty much know what causes impact crater even though we've never seen one outside the lab all we just got to see one this week and we're going to get pictures of it soon or well in a few years when Hera gets there i guess lichia cube has the lichia cube and i've seen pictures of um so here is one way to get a little bit of uh more data about airburst this is a type of airburst it's a very different type um it's an explosion that starts at the ground but uh, this happened on January 15th, the Tonga explosion. And I did uh, run a simulation of this. Um, I had to make some assumptions, um, but this is, this is my first cut of the simulation. And I was really interested in this wave that propagates. So that's a lamb wave. You can see some very interesting bouncing, some atmospheric phenomena where, where the plume goes up Gravity pulls it down and it compresses the air. It goes back up. It, it, so there's multiple oscillations of this bouncing that are also creating waves. But that lamb wave, um, that actually circled the earth several times and it was observed. So this is actually, this pressure perturbation is actually based on data. And so you can see it going around, converging at the anapode, coming back, converging at the location of the source, coming back and it, there were several of these oscillations that happened over a day. Now, one of the really interesting- So that's data, that's not simulation? I'm sorry? That's simulation or data? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like aggregated data that's then turned into a simulation. So the simulation is basically a fit to the data. So this is, so this is a land wave, which is kind of like a shock wave, but, not instantaneous pressure rise like a shock wave and it's actually subsonic unlike a shock wave because it's channeled throughout the entire atmospheric column and and the wave speed isn't the same at all altitudes is it just barometers distributed around the globe it's barometers tide gauges um there's actually these uh tsunami gauges in the pacific throughout the pacific and they measured it and so they they measure pressure and so they actually measure atmospheric pressure as well as tsunami. So there's there's multiple sources of data, and that's called DART two. They the, the tsunami gauges are called DART two, which is a little confusing. Um, so so my colleague, who's a tsunami modeler, took that lamb wave. Um, he he took my wave that I modeled in the near field, and he combined it with the lamb wave fit to the data throughout the world and he generated a tsunami model and this is what his tsunami model looks like and here's the interesting thing it doesn't <clears throat> stop it it doesn't stop at the end it goes into the atlantic because normally the way we think of tsunami is that you know they're the, the there's they come from the source from the near field only they're not forced by the atmospheric wave, but this is a tsunami. It's a type of meteor tsunami that is actually forced by the atmospheric pressure. So that pressure wave crosses the continents. It goes into other ocean basins and it was actually observed. There were small tsunami waves from Hunga Tonga from that eruption uh, near Puerto Rico and in the Mediterranean. And they actually get, and I, I don't have time to go into the detail, but there's something called a Proudman resonance. When the uh, uh, atmospheric wave matches the speed of the uh, shallow water wave in the ocean, there's a resonance, they match. It's just like surfing, right? If the surfer is going the same speed as the wave she's surfing on, she continues to get energy out of the wave. If she runs out ahead of it, there's nothing pushing on her. If she, if she lets the wave run out of it, head of her she's done but staying riding that wave and there are certain directions along the deep trenches where the land wave matches the wave of the uh, tsunami and so in those directions they get amplified and this is actually something that's been well known for years 
It just hasn't been applied to this. So in places like the Mediterranean, <clears throat> where, the, where the waves are fairly uh, slow because the water is shallow, um, the, the, uh, uh, a weather front can do that. And in places like the Great Lakes, they, they actually get these. And sometimes they're just called rogue waves. Nobody knows where they come from. And those will show up. And it usually has to do with a weather front moving across. And they just happen to be in resonance. So now, you know, we, we have to think about, we've always thought about tsunami risk. So part of planetary defense is risk assessment and probabilistic risk assessment. And we do these uh, scenarios, we do these tabletop exercises. And the one for the upcoming planetary defense conference, which is next April, um, has just been released and it's a huge impact. And for, for purposes of intercomparison, we're doing some other tabletop exercises where we assume that it hits Dallas. So this is an 800 meter diameter. Uh, this is my simulation of an, uh, and a crude two dimensional simulation of an 800 meter diameter, 10 gigaton explosion over Dallas and the wave motion in the atmosphere that comes out of that. So here, here we go. And so you can see it's very much like Tonga, except on a much bigger scale. And just this oscillation, oscillating atmosphere, a lot of uh, vorticity, and a lot of a lot of other effects that drive more waves. But the LAM wave from that should be much bigger. And even though it's well inland, Dallas is pretty far, 400 kilometers, 350 kilometers from the Gulf Coast, you should be getting tsunamis all over the world from something like this. So that's part of the risk. We have to feed that into our risk assessment. And so what can we do about it? Um, I ran these simulation years ago. And um, one of the things I showed was um, what would happen if you completely blew it to smithereens. This isn't what the dark test was about. The dark test was kinetic deflection, hitting it and then exchanging momentum um, but this is a this is a one potential way to do it. But is there a way to do it without actually like sending Bruce Willis to drill a hole and put a nuclear bomb in the middle? And for smaller ones, uh, there may be a way to do that. So if Dallas is at the very center here, and this is Houston, you can see what would happen if you busted this up through some mechanism into lots and lots of pieces. And those pieces were no bigger than Chelyabinsk sized <coughs> objects. Um, what would happen at the surface? And you get individual explosions, none of which are deadly to anybody on the surface. So, you know, you could potentially take the hit as long as you break it up. And 100% of the energy of the original object is coupled into the atmosphere, but it's it's uh, it's no longer synchronized. So you basically you you instead of having one big shock wave that blows all your buildings over, you have lots of little ones that all it does, all they do is blow your windows out. So very different in terms of effect on the surface. And so that's all I have to say. But I'm happy to answer questions. And here's all my sponsors and collaborators and institutions that were involved because this is years of this is like decades of work. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we have a tradition here that the we uh, the first question always goes to a grad student. So grad students, questions online. No questions online. Uh, I have a question, Robert. Okay, John. <laughs> oh, why did the trees fall inward in Tonguska? They didn't. They fell outward. Or rather, so outward. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So, so as that blast wave, I mean, it, you know, imagine just a point source explosion, which is how we really thought of Tonguska for a long time. We compared it to nuclear explosion, which we had data for. And so you got, you know, this spherically expanding shockwave where first motion was outward. And when that hits the ground, it reflects, um, but you still have outward motion. The component of motion at ground level is horizontal and directed outwards. 
But I remember people saying in the past that it was very strange that the trees all fell inwards. I'm pretty sure of that. I don't, I haven't seen that and all the published uh, papers and images show them lying outward. I visited the area some time, some years ago, and that was a big feature of the discussion. They didn't understand the inward falling trees. You know, I, I can't say with certainty that some didn't fall inward. And, and you know, I know that um, where the last wave, one of the, one of the proxies actually that, that people have used for estimating the strength, and I showed that map of, of Giuseppe Longo, um, and he had regions that were colored with different colors that depended on his inferred strength of the shock wave. And that strength of the shock wave was by how well aligned the trees were. That was the proxy he used. So there are places where the shock wave was weaker, where there's more, uh, more variation in the directions. But you can imagine also if there was, you know, there is topography there. And so if there's a reflection, you can get uh, a reflecting shock that blows inwards. But I'm, I'm not aware of a pattern of trees that were blown inward. In fact, I'm not aware of any trees that were blown inward. Right. You know, I should, you know, just to um, add to that, you've probably seen that there were uh, some tests at the Nevada test site of an atmospheric uh, explosion. <laughs> And where they have trees, and you can see the trees going down one way, and then there's then there's the they don't they don't actually blow over, and then there's the suction phase. So a blast wave is like an end wave where where the phase where the direction changes, and so there's winds going the other way too. And if they didn't snap the first time, it's possible they could snap on their way back from that that rarefaction wave. What was the event in Atacama since Atacama is the Really, really long. I'm sorry. Where was the event in Atacama? Because the Atacama is uh, a very, very long yeah. zone yeah. in the desert in Chile. It's called the Pica Glass, and Pica is a place name, but I don't know my geography of Chile. <clears throat> I was curious because one of the pe part people who does great astronomical um photography, Sergei Brunet, um, also as part of documenting things for ESO, shot this whole series of this book called Atacama. It's in French, yeah. right? Um, but he also documented sites along there yeah. where there were um, petroglyphs and other yeah. types of events. And I was kind of curious because um, because part of this whole thing about doing the sky simulations and Milky Way galaxy rotation covered the history in this yeah. extensive zone. Yeah, this was so this event was dated roughly 12,000 years. Um, and it's, you know, there's some uncertainty on that. Um, but they're probably, you know, if, if there were um, people living there at the time, um, I'm not sure you know, if, they, if there would be anything recorded about this. No, it was just, it, it's more that there's this <clears throat> history of also oh, yeah. documenting where the rock art and other things were right. in that area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so of your type two airbursts, the ones that reached the ground. So if there are two examples in 12 years, 12,000 years, Roughly, uh, what's the fraction of the surface that's actually been probed by such measurements? Well, yeah. So obviously, the exposed like yeah. silicon now, like it's over the ocean, you're not going to get anything. Yeah, even <clears throat> even the peak of glass, the Atacama glass, that that's not the only explanation. There are, there are researchers who strongly disagree that it was airburst. Um, it could be. Um, I think that's the only realistic explanation for the Libyan desert glass. Um, there's also the Dakhla glass, which I think there are people who think there are other explanations for that as well. 
But again, there's kind of a selection or observational selection bias. Um, you know, lithium desert glass, um, being that it's pure silica, there's no um, chemical weathering. Virtually, you know, it's in a desert. So there's no, not a lot. I mean, it hasn't always been desert, but it's very stable chemically. Not all glasses, you know, if you just took random alluvium or, or soil and you fused it and turned it to glass, it wouldn't last very long, especially in most climates. So you wouldn't see any evidence. And then, of course, two thirds of them hit the ocean. And so, you know, there probably are other examples out there that people will find. And a lot of glasses masquerade as other types of glasses. You know, geologists don't tend to look at float and glasses are gonna be float. They're gonna be not part of the stratigraphic record. So how do you even recognize them? If somebody finds a piece of glass, you know, it's been transported, it's volcanic. So I don't think, it, you know, it's hard to recognize unless it's isolated and unique like living desert glass. So I think this, we, we do have ways to estimate the, uh, how often these happen, what's the probability? We think Tunguska was probably once every 500 to 1,000 years on average. You know, it's random, but on average, that would be the recurrence interval. Tunguska didn't make any glass, and if it had been 200 years old rather than 100 years, there might be legends about it, but there wouldn't be any evidence, and we'd probably not have any idea what it, the legend was even about. So they are rare events. So glass forming events are even more rare than non-glass forming events like Tunguska. Chelly events, we think maybe once every 50 or something like that happens on average. So they're rare events. Oh, Eric. I got a question about uh, the Atacama timing. Um, that's very close to the end of the Younger Dryas where an impact has been suggested. Could there be a relation? I don't. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Schultz et al. paper on the Pika glass, their error bars on the, on the date don't include the Younger Dryas boundary, which is about 12.9 thousand years. Um, so I don't think it has anything to do with the Younger Dryas. Although it's been embraced by the Younger Dryas promoters as being evidence for their hypothesis, even though it, it really isn't. Thanks. Eric? Yeah, so at the start of your talk, you suggested that, you know, by observing these events, we could learn something about uh, asteroid composition. Uh, so I was just wondering, like, how, how much do the explosions differ depending on like what you assume about the properties of an asteroid? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So we can, you know, I'm a modeler, and and so I have to make assumptions about strength <clears throat> and density and you know coherence and all of that stuff. And and if I vary those parameters, the outcome changes a lot. Um, you know how deep it penetrates. You know how it breaks up. How it fragments. And, and so, you know, I don't really have a way to validate. And in fact, one thing I started doing, and I started doing years ago, is rat, you know, I used to try to like make all these assumptions. And then I'd say, well, what would happen if it blew up, you know, 12 kilometers above the surface instead of six kilometers? And I'd try to tune those parameters to get it blow up. And it was re really sensitive, but also sensitive to resolution and, you know, other more computational issues. And finally, I just threw up my hands and it's like, okay, I'm just going to figure out a way to pres prescribe the altitude at which it blows up. And, and there are tricks, computational tricks to do that. And that's how I've done it ever since. But ultimately, in order to properly model and test your models, you have to have data. And, and so I, and I think the data that we would get from observing an airburst from something that we'd observed in space. So we know the shape, we know the size, we have some idea of the composition. That would be super useful. And it would be useful for both risk assessment and also for you know designing deflection um, experiments, just like the DART experiment was. Only I think we could do a lot of these experiments 
you know, we if we had more telescope, if we had you know more telescopes like Atlas telescopes all over the world, and you know, you can fund a lot for you know the 300 million dollars that was spent on DART for one experiment. And I'm not I'm not criticizing DART. I think it's a great experiment and it was worth doing. But how many of those? Can be? Let's end with you. Suppose you have an asteroid uh, striking the Pacific Ocean. How sensitive is the height of the tsunami wave to the entry angle? And kind of a related question, how big an object would it have to be before people living in Hawaii would have to worry about it? Those are all good questions, and those are things that we plan to address with what we learned from, from the Hongadonga explosion. I mean, that, that, that data is so rich and you know, we really want to model that and then we want to apply those models to the questions and just ask. I think it's, you know, we think of a volcanic eruption as being something of interest to volcanologists and, and maybe tsunami modelers, but not planetary defense people. But I think this is going to be a really useful data point for us. So you don't really know the answer? I don't know the answer. Yeah, that's that's the short answer. But the long answer is I want to figure out the answer. Right, let's take work again.